speaking of not knowing what's going to happen, um, at the last moment I decided to add a few verses um, to what you see in the bulletin. So, in addition to verses 1 through 13, I am also going to be reading uh, verses 32 through 37 of Mark 13. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your support. <laughs> a reading from the Gospel of Mark. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. It will all be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. But this is the beginning of the birth pangs. As for yourselves, beware, for they will hand you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governments and kings because of me, as a testimony to them. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. When they bring you to trial and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are going to say. But say what is ever, whatever is given to you at that time, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn. Or else, he may, or else he may find you asleep when he comes, suddenly, and what I say to you, I say to all. Keep awake. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Just a few short weeks ago, we welcomed Jesus into our world as a little child. The Christmas Jesus brings with him a great sense of hope, joy, and love. For many of us, it's really easy to get caught up in this joy, and maybe even to sustain it for a while. That is, until you turn on the television, pick up a newspaper, or scan any of your internet news feeds for the latest happenings. It seems that every time I look at the news, there's nothing but war, poverty, murder, injustice, and pain. I'm very sensitive to these realities, and I know many of you are too. Some days it's so bad that functioning is almost out of the question. On those days, all I want to do is cry. All I want to do is stay in bed. And of course, crying isn't bad for many of us. It's cleansing. The problems start when we can't move on from that, when our despair turns to paralyzing fear and anger. We have to remember that before Jesus spoke, 
taught or preached, he cried. Maybe it's just because that's what babies do, they, they cry. But I think the tears of Jesus were more than just signs for, I'm hungry, or I need a diaper change. They were the tears of Emmanuel, God with us. God chose to be born into this broken world with its unrest, knowing exactly what kind of pain could be found here. Baby Jesus became a man who still cried, yet never let anything, not even death, keep him from moving. Each day he rose to help heal his beloved people, giving them reason to rejoice in the face of great fear and darkness. It's in a place of fear that we find Jesus in our gospel today. Jesus and the disciples are outside of the temple in Jerusalem. They've just watched a poor widow come and give her last coins to the temple treasury. After watching this humble act, they comment on the greatness of the temple and the surrounding buildings with all of their large stones. Jesus answers that by telling them that these great buildings, which have taken decades to build, are all going to come crashing down. We know that Jesus isn't just talking about the temple in Jerusalem, but also his own body as well. At that moment, the temple and his body become the same, and he's foretelling his own death and resurrection. It's important to note that Jesus is not predicting the end of the world, but rather an end of an age. This passage is sometimes called the Little Apocalypse, and it's been misinterpreted by many to predict the warning signs of the end times. Jesus isn't doing that. In addition to his own death, he's predicting the future destruction of the city, the temple, and with it, the focus of temple worship and religious life. In place of the temple, the sole authority of the church would now rest with Jesus. He would now be the direct link to God. He promises the disciples that when the end does come, it will be unmistakable. This was meant to bring hope to them, as well as us, the future Christians, and give us the strength to know that we can get through anything, that this is not the end, that we are saved. This is good news for us as we watch businesses and huge corporations rake in unprecedented profits while refusing to pay their workers a living wage. As we watch people go hungry and without health care, as we watch our children attend underfunded schools that are literally crumbling. It's good news as we watch parents bury their children gone down in the streets as we hear of young girls being kidnapped from their homes in the night, forced into slavery. As we see veterans return home, forgotten and forced into homelessness. And Mother Earth, she's being dragged into this too. The planet's being split open, cut down, polluted, and ravaged to the point of death. I mean, this has to be good news. We need good news. Otherwise, what are we to do in the face of such horror? The words of Jesus ring true today. It seems that every stone is falling. If the world continues in this direction, not one stone will be left upon another. All this fear and hopelessness that comes with it Maybe this is how the women in Bethlehem felt after Herod murdered an entire generation of baby boys. Can you even imagine? But in the midst of this, a miracle happened that Herod never saw coming. As he desperately searched for the little king that would become the ruler of Israel, Mary and Joseph fled into Egypt with the newborn Jesus. And the Messiah escaped. And his escape meant life and comfort 
for all in the kingdom to come. Death followed Jesus from the time of his birth to his crucifixion to well after his resurrection. But the Messiah escaped it every time. The temples can fall. The temples will fall. But Christ's love and grace will always be with us. So when we are tempted to despair, let us remember the words of Jesus to the disciples. Beware that no one leads you astray. This includes not just people, but what we see in the media, what we hear in our schools, in our places of employment, even in church. If we are too preoccupied with the details of destruction, we can fail to see the people right in front of us who need help, who need to be cared for. That's why Jesus tells Peter, James, John, and Andrew not to be alarmed when bad things happen because they're going to happen. They can't know when or where things are going to go wrong. Instead of raising alarm every time the temple looks like it's going to fall, we must keep awake. We must be aware of our responsibilities to God's people in the very moment of their need. <coughs> Doing otherwise raises fear, not only in others, but in ourselves. And as we know, this can be absolutely paralyzing. Jesus was very sensitive to the realities of suffering, just as we are. He wept for his friends. He wept over his enemies before they crucified him. And he wept for himself, crying out to God from the cross. Yet he always remained vigilant, knowing that this was not the end. He knew that even though he would be arrested, beaten, and persecuted, it would be in his watchfulness that he would endure. And he promises it will be the same for us. How we react to times of stress depends on the individual. Some of us write letters, run food pantries, teach underprivileged youth, help others through recovery programs, or participate in some form of activism. Some of us feel the need to have our voices heard in other ways, while others prefer to listen. A few weeks ago, I needed to do a little bit of both. I was getting into one of those non-functioning moods right around the time the protests in Ferguson, Missouri began. I felt like I needed to do something. I needed to get out of the house. I needed to learn more about what's going on in the world from the people who are most affected by injustice. I couldn't just sit there and pretend like nothing was happening or go back to my TV programs or Netflix binging. I had the opportunity to do that at a peaceful rally organized by several grassroots organizations dedicated to working to social justice here in Rochester. And on that day, people from every walk of life gathered in downtown Rochester. They shared their concerns, their laments, their fears surrounding rising incarceration rates, crippling poverty, and rising gun violence. Mothers cried, feeling hopeless to protect their children once they left the house. They were terrified that they would be the next mother to receive a call that their baby had been gunned down on the street. People sang songs about healing the world and making it a better place where every person could live a life of dignity. All of us were there because we needed hope. We needed to see that all lives matter, and then we needed to be moved to do something other than fear that. You would be proud to know that several folks from Emmanuel were there in a show of solidarity. As we gathered, I immediately noticed there were several young families in the crowd with bundled up babies in tow. At one point, as we were marching downtown, we ended up behind this beautiful brown-eyed baby boy looking at us from over his mother's shoulder. People surrounded us, 
hands raised in protest, crying, stop this pain, save our city. Of course, he didn't seem to mind the noise at all. He was happy just to hang out and be there. Then the most amazing thing happened. We spoke to him, as you do with babies, oh hello, and he started giggling. It was absolutely beautiful to hear that child's holy laughter against the cry of the protesters brought tears to my eyes. And in his smile, I saw the infant Jesus, hope incarnate, bringing joy into a world filled with sorrow. That little one reminded me that to such the kingdom of God belongs. He reminded me that we need to have trust in Jesus Christ Trust as strong and innocent as a little child's bumbled up against his mother's chest. On my bad days, I have to remind myself the fate of the world is not ultimately in my hands. Change will come, and sometimes change looks like pain. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, sisters and brothers against one another. We see it every day. We can either let those realities slow us down, or we can use the anger and sadness we feel as fuel for our Christian witness to this world. We can either stay in bed, or we can feed the hungry, clothe the naked, help the oppressed, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. It's the great paradox of grace. God promises we are saved, and that promise remains even when we can neither see it nor even trust it. It's there. It's our duty to keep watch, to keep the Master's house ready at every hour. We must do what we can to keep it warm, lit, and full of life, and when we can, full of laughter. We don't have to wait until Christmas to find Jesus in this world. He's already here with us, wailing and weeping, laughing and singing, bringing new life at the end of an age. The Holy Spirit dances around us in a sound of baby's laughter, pulls us closer with every tear that we shed for this world. Our temples will fall, and they should. It's only then that we can stop trying to love on our own and love with God's love, which is the most powerful force in this whole universe. When we answer the call to keep watch, we can then begin to see God in the cracked city sidewalks, the wail of an ambulance, in the line out of the door and around the corner waiting for food stamps and unemployment checks. We return to ourselves and find Jesus through his beloved people pulling men and women from the rubble, digging them out of landslides, creating safe haven for the refugee, and teaching our children how to garden. We see him drying our tears and healing our aching hearts. In time, we will remember that Christ's love is all around us, every bit as present in our cries for help as they are in our cries for joy. Laughing and crying are no different. They are signs of life. And where there is life, there is hope. And that's good news.